Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And um, we're going to continue our study of A.T. Jones' Third Angel's Messages um, from 1893. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours, for the time that we have uh, together and that the fellowship we can have with you and with each, with each other. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak to us, help me to have a clear mind, and uh, to present these things clearly. And we pray, Lord, that each one of us can understand the things uh, that we read. We need your presence in our lives. We need to know how to trust in you and to have faith and confidence in you. And uh, we know, Lord, that these messages given by A.T. Jones in the past um, was a special message, and that he was a cho chosen messenger. And we just pray, Lord, that um, we can appreciate these words. Be with each person in their personal life, and may the Sabbath be a blessing for each one. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're on uh, lecture number 18, and uh, Jones, of course, is going to just do a bit of a re review himself. But remember when we started this, this uh, began with A.T. Jones talking about first the need of the Holy Spirit and then going into um, the situation relating to the Sunday law as he understood it. And that is, he looked at 1888 and 1892. He references 1888 and the present time that they're in is 1892, 1893, dealing with the Chicago World's Fair. And he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And so he's in a very similar situation to what we believe about our time. But we know that this history is typifying our history. So the message here the third angel's message. Uh, Jones is clear that these are part of a group of messages, the first and the second angel. Um, so this series I call the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. One of the things that we've come to understand is the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. Um, and that is it's in our experience in reality. It's righteousness by faith demonstrated but it doesn't mean that the first two angels messages are not righteousness by faith because indeed they are uh, the first angel being fear god give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come i mean we can see clearly relates uh to the work of salvation um of justification sanctification and judgment or glorification so let us begin reading this, and I will comment here and there, but um, if people have comments or questions, feel free to participate. Um, and uh, sometimes the questions that we have are things that need to be brought out, and if there's something we don't understand, uh, there might be somebody else who has the same question. So, don't, so feel free, don't be afraid uh, to interrupt me. <clears throat> our study last night was in order to know for ourselves and how we may know that we have the blessing of Abraham and thus be prepared to be sure that with confidence we may ask for the Spirit of God. There is more of that yet. The Lord has given us yet further evidence, yet further proof upon which to base our perfect confidence in him in his righteousness, and that, that that is our own, that we have the righteousness which is by faith, so we can ask in perfect confidence for his Holy Spirit, and thank the Lord that it is our own. For remember the verse reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles 
through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, um, so remember here that Abraham is this example of faith. And that why is it that Abraham, um, what was it that he said about Abraham regarding that he also a, is an example through the Gent for the Gentiles? What was the reasoning that was there? Why is he an example for everyone, both for Jew and Gentile? But Abraham's the father of many nations, of all nations. Okay. When Abraham received the covenant, had he been when, circumcised? Uh, no, he wasn't no. circumcised when he received the covenant. Right. So he's not, he, so he represents both those that are circumcised and those that are not circumcised, right? Both yeah. you and Jen, yeah. right? So, and that's an important point to keep in mind. Um. Now, uh, this part here about the curse of the law, right, which he's going to uh, expound upon a little bit. He's going to show the role of the law um, in salvation. But also we know that uh, Christ is cursed. That is, he was made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, we also understand the curse in relationship to the 2520. And we know that the 70 weeks is also connected to Leviticus 26. So this curse that, that Christ experiences, um, not everyone fully understands the implication of that in its relationship to the covenant, right? Because he's going to confirm the covenant for many uh or with many, for one week, right, in the midst of the week. <clears throat> the blessing of Abraham is the righteousness of faith that we are to have in order to receive and that we may have the promise of the Spirit, and that also through faith. Well, then, when we have the evidence, the proof, the perfect work of God demonstrating to our complete satisfaction, that we can ask in perfect confidence for the Holy Spirit, then is it not ours to receive that by faith? Is it not ours to thank God that that is our own and that it simply remains for him to manifest it at his own will whenever occasion may require and as occasion may need? Well, let us study then some other evidence that he has given us study this tonight in connection with what we had last night so that we may have before us fresh what the Lord himself has opened for us upon which to base our confidence before him upon which we may be sure where we stand and upon which we may ask with the full assurance of faith and when we ask according to his will and ask that we may have that which he has promised, then he heareth us. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. First John 5, verse 14 and 15. And then we can thank him that that is our own. Let us begin with the fifth chapter of Romans, 20th verse. The real point, or we might say one of the main points of the study tonight, is to see what place the law of God occupies in the subject of righteousness by faith. What place the law of God occupies in our obtaining righteousness alone by Jesus Christ. And this is simply another phase of the same thought we had last night as to what proof the Lord has given us to give us confidence that we can claim by faith the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we say that God can give us confidence, I mean, one of the things that's quite clear that this is not presumption. So I've seen many people presume 
That is, they believe they have something that they do not have. And and I gave an example of this, uh, which was um, uh, Light Bear's camp meeting, I believe 1987, it must have been. Um, that was John um, Whitcomb. He also wrote a book on um, uh, the third the third jihad, right? So he's he's an Adventist pastor now, but at that time he was saying that he hadn't sinned since March, and this is June or July. So um, that would be presumption, but he was calling it faith. So we need to understand the distinction between faith and presumption, uh, so that we can have true confidence. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, Romans 3, verse 20, the last words, words with which you are all familiar, by the law is the knowledge of sin. What was the law given for on tables of stone, the first purpose of its given? Congregation, to show us what sin is. To make sin abound, to give the knowledge of sin, so the law entered that the offense, the offense might abound, that sin might appear, that it might appear as it is. Paul, speaking in the seventh chapter of Romans, says how it appeared to him, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Then to make sin abound and make it appear as it is, exceeding sinful, that is the first object of the giving of the law, isn't it? Now let us read right on in Romans 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Then did the law come alone, making sin to appear alone, and that alone. So that's kind of a, a weird question. But um, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So... Did the law come alone? He asked, making sin to appear alone and that alone. So what is he, he's asking is, is the law just showing us what sin is? And the congregation answers no. So that's not the purpose of the law, just to, to show us that we're sinners. Alone, right? That's part of it purpose but this is simply a means to another end the means to an end by which to attain another object beyond the knowledge of sin is that so congregation yes so then where sin abounds where is it that grace abounds congregation in the same place right there congregation yes but does it read that way where sin abounded grace abounded congregation no, much more. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? If, if it was only where sin abounds, their grace abounds. And that would be pretty good. But that is not the way the Lord does things, you know. He does things absolutely well. Entirely good. Just as good as God could do. Well then, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Congregation, amen. Then, brethren, when the Lord by his law, has given us the knowledge of sin, just at that very moment, at that very point, grace is much more abundant than the knowledge of sin. Is that so, congregation? Yes. In another word, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we have found this much, that when the law gives the knowledge of sin at that particular moment, in that very place and at the very point in that very thing, the grace of God is much more abundant than the knowledge of sin. 
But when the law gives the knowledge of sin, what puts the conviction there? Congregation, the spirit of God. So he's going to go the direction that I would go. Um, dealing with the Holy Spirit is what brings conviction. Before we read the passage, which says so, however, let us see what we are to get so far from what we have read. What are you and I henceforth to get from the knowledge of sin? Congregation, abundance of grace. So God doesn't just show us our sin. He also gives us his righteousness. Then there is no plausible place for discouragement at the sight of sins anymore. Is there? Congregation, no. No possibility of that. It is impossible, you see, for you and me to get discouraged or under a cloud anymore at the knowledge of sin. Because there's no difference how great the knowledge is, no difference how many sins are revealed to us and brought to our knowledge. Why, right there, at that very moment, in those very things, and at that very time in our experience, the grace of God much more abounds than all the knowledge of sins. Well, then I say again, how is it possible for us ever to be discouraged? Brethren, isn't it so that the Lord wants us to be of good cheer? Congregation, amen. Be of good cheer. Now, of course, we've seen this in our own lives and in the lives of others around us. That once we accept the light that reveals the knowledge of sin, which is the law, the law reveals the character of Christ, uh, we also have attached to that God's mercy. And that's why people who accept the light, the knowledge of their sins, can then turn from those sins, can conf confess their sins, can repent and walk in newness of life. If all, all the law ever did was just show us our sins without this abundance of grace being shown to us, we would be without hope in this world. Well, now, this verse that we have before us brings the same thing to view, John 16, verse 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. What is he telling us, congregation? Truth, good. And he has told us also that ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That is it then, isn't it? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. Who will not come? Congregation, the comforter. The comforter, is that his name? Is that what he is, the comforter? Congregation, yes. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, who has come? Congregation, the comforter. Who? Congregation, the comforter. And when he has come, he will reprove or convince or convict the world of sin. Who is it that does it? Congregation says the comforter. It is the comforter that convinces of sin? Congregation says yes. Is he the comforter when he does that? They say yes. Now, each one wants to get hold of that. Is not he the reprover when he does it and the comforter some other time? Congregation says no. It is the comforter that reproves. Thank the Lord. The comforter reproves. Thank the Lord. That what we are to get out of the reproof of sin. Then what are we to get out of the reproof of sin? Congregation, comfort. Whose comfort? Congregation, the Lord's comfort. The comfort we get comforts just at the time when it is needed. Then where is the room for our getting discouraged anymore at the knowledge of sin? Isn't that the very thought that we have read in the fifth chapter of Romans? Don't you see then that when we bear in mind just at the moment and at the time and at the place where that where sin abounds, their grace much more abounds. And just at the time when, um, when the Holy Spirit is giving conviction of sin, pardon me there, um, he is the comforter that does it. Don't you see that in all that, remembering all that, we have an everlasting victory over Satan? Does Satan get the advantage?
percentage of that man who believes God right then? No. Satan comes and says, see what a sinner you are. Thank the Lord. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Congregation says, amen. Well, says another, I have such a deep conviction of sin. It seems to me I was never convicted of sin so deeply before in all my life. Thank the Lord. We have got more comfort than ever before in our lives. Don't you see, brethren, that that is so? Congregation, it is so. Well, then, let us thank the Lord for that. The congregation says, amen. I should like to know why we should not praise the Lord right along. But there is some more in that Romans 5 verse 20. And what is this all for? First, we found that the law makes sin abound in order that grace may abound so that we may have the grace to lead us to Christ. Now, what are the two things together for? The law making sin abound in order that more grace may abound. What are they both together for? That, as sin hath reigned unto death. We know that so, don't we? Now that is so. The law makes sin abound, that we may be led to more abundance of grace, in order that, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. What does even so mean? Just as certainly, just so. Then isn't it so that God will make that abundance of grace reign in our lives, just as certainly as ever sin did in the world? Congregation, yes, sir. But mark you, when the grace much more bountifully reigns, then what is the comparison between freedom from sin now and the slavery to it before? The freedom is much more abundant even than the slavery was. That is, sin hath reigned unto death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Now let us see the whole story. The law entered that the offense might abound in order that we might find the more abundant grace abounding right there in all those places. And the grace abounds through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Then what did the law enter for, voice? To bring us to the Lord. Um, what did the law enter for, voice? To bring us to Christ. Yes, don't you see? Then whenever anybody in this world uses the Ten Commandments, when any sinner in this world uses the Ten Commandments for any purpose, for any other purpose than to reach Jesus Christ, what kind of a purpose is he putting them to? Congregation, a wrong purpose. He is perverting the intent of God in giving the law, isn't he? Congregation, a wrong purpose. He is perverting the intent, intent of God in giving the law, isn't he? Congregation, yes, sir. To use the law of God with men for any other purpose, therefore, than that they may reach Christ Jesus is to use the law in a way that God never intended it to be used. Well, the law then brings us to Christ, that's certain. What for? Congregation, that we may be justified. What does the law want of you and me? Does it make any demands of us before we reach Jesus Christ? When the law finds us, does it want anything from us? Congregation, it wants righteousness. What kind? Congregation, perfect righteousness. Whose? Congregation, God's. God's righteousness? Congregation, yes. Just such righteousness alone as manifests in his own life, in his own way of doing things? Congregation, yes. Will that law be content with anything less than that from you and me? Will it accept anything less than that? A hair's breadth less, congregation? No. If we could come within a hair's breadth of it, that's too far short. We miss it. Turn to Timothy, and Paul tells us what the law wants out of you and me, and what it wants in us, too. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. Now, the end, the object, the aim, the intent, the purpose of the commandment is charity. 
What is charity? Congregation, love. What kind of love? Congregation, the love of God. Out of a pure heart, what kind of heart? Congregation, a pure heart. And of a good conscience, what kind of conscience? Congregation, good. And of faith unfeigned. That, that is what the law wants to find in you and me, isn't it? Will it accept you and me with anything less than that which it demands? Perfect love, manifested out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned? No, never. Well, that is simply perfection that it demands. Now, you know, there are a lot of people who want to lower that, the demands of the law in the sense of being more um, inclusive, right? In the sense of, you know, we're, we're all sinners. We're always going to be sinning. And so we do our best and God does the rest. God makes up for it with his righteousness. But if there is any of our righteousness in there at all, is it perfect? No. Because all of our righteousness is filthy rags. Yeah. So there can't be any of our righteousness in it. The law won't accept any of our righteousness. It only accepts God's righteousness. But that righteousness has to be in the life. It's not just, the God doesn't just take his perfect garment of character and place it over our, you know, filthy garments. Because this has to come out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. It has to be perfect love, and it has to be manifest in us. So we have to be perfect. And that's something that's impossible for us to do. We can't produce perfect righteousness. But the law demands it. And different people have solutions. Some people just remove the law as a means of measuring our righteousness. The law has to be done away. But there is other more deceitful ways in which this is done, more subversive ways. But anyway, let's go on and read what Jones has to say here about this. Well, now, have we, has any man in the world, any of that kind of love to offer to the law of God? Congregation, no. Is any man naturally that kind of conscience? Congregation, no. No, sir. Well, then, the law makes that demand of every man on the earth tonight. No difference who he is. He makes it of you and me. He makes that demand of people in Africa and of all the people on the earth. And he will not accept anything less than that from any one of them. We are talking about ourselves tonight. And so the law comes to you and me tonight and says, I want charity. I want perfect love, the love of God. I want to see it in your life all the time. And I want to see it manifested out of a pure heart and through a good conscience and unfeigned faith. That is where we are. Well, says one, I have not got it. I've done my best. But the law will say, that is not what I want. I don't want your best. I want perfection. It is not your doing. I want anyhow. It is God's I want. It is not your righteousness I am after. I want God's righteousness from you. It is not your doing I want. I want God's doing in your life. That is what the law says to every man. And when I am shut off thus at the very first question, and even then when I said I did my best, then I have nothing more to say. Is that not what the scripture says, that every mouth may be stopped? It does just that, does it not? But there comes a still small voice saying, here is a perfect life. Here is the life of God. Here is a pure heart. Here is a good conscience. Here is unfeigned faith. Where does that voice come from? Congregation, Christ. Ah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and stood where I stand in the flesh in which I live. He lived there. The perfect love of God was manifested there. The perfect purity of heart manifested there. A good conscience manifested there. And the unfeigned faith 
of the mind that was in Jesus Christ is there. Well then, he simply comes and tells me, here, take this. That will satisfy them, will it? Congregation, yes. The life manifested in Jesus Christ that will satisfy the law. The purity of heart that Jesus Christ gives, that will satisfy the law. The good conscience that he can create, that will satisfy. The unfeigned faith which he gives, that will satisfy. Will it? Congregation, yes. Well then, is not that, is that, well then, is that not what the law wants all the time? It is Jesus Christ that the law wants, is it not? Congregation, yes. That is what the law wants. That is the same thing which it calls for in the fifth of Romans, is it not? But why does it call for it in connection with me? It calls for Christ in me. Because the law wants to see that thing in me. Then is not the object of the law, the gospel of Christ alone? Christ is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is so. Romans 5, uh, verse 1 and 5. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Us, unto us and that is charity supreme love acts 15 verse 8 and 9 and god which knoweth the hearts bear them witness giving them the holy ghost even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith there is the love of god out of a pure heart hebrews 9 verse 14 how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? There is a clean conscience, brethren. And there is the love of God out of a good conscience. Then the faith which he gives, which he enables us to keep, the faith of Jesus, which enables us to keep the commandments of God, there is the love of God by faith unfeigned. Oh, then, the message of the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, brings us to and brings to us the perfect fulfillment of the law of God, does it not? Congregation, yes. Then that is the object and the aim and the one single point of the third angel's message, is it not? Congregation, yes. That is Christ. Christ in his righteousness. Christ in his purity. Christ in his love. Christ in his gentleness. Christ in his entire being. Christ in him crucified. That is the word, brethren. Let us be glad of it. Let us be glad of it. Congregation says, amen. So when we have Jesus when we have received him by faith and the law stands before us or we stand before it and it makes its wondrous, wondrous demand of charity, we can say, here it is. It is in Christ and he is mine. Out of a pure heart, here it is in Christ and he has given it to me, a good conscience. The blood of Christ has created it in me. Here it is, faith unfeigned the faith in Jesus. He hath given it to me. Here it is. Then just as steps to Christ tells us, we can come to Jesus now and be cleansed and stand before the law without one touch of shame or remorse. Good. Brethren, when I have that, which makes me at perfect agreement with the law of God, then I am satisfied and cannot help but be glad that I am satisfied. Now, this reminds me um, regarding the conscience, because one of the things that we looked at when we looked at the book of Hebrews is that the blood of bulls and goats cannot make a man perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And so when he talks about a good 
conscience here? What, what is a conscience? What does conscience have to do with? Think of the word, the parts of the word there. Well, your inner being. Your... Okay, but think of the words. It, it's con science, right? Okay. Science. So science has to do with knowledge. <clears throat> yeah. Right? And, and so this is a, a good knowledge, a certain type of knowledge, right? A conscience. And, and the blood of bulls and goats cannot make man perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Because we would have no more conscience of sins if those sins had been purged. But is it true of the 144,000 that when their, their sins are blotted out, that they have no conscience of sins? No, well, they're still going to have conscience of sins. Well, okay, so their sins have been blotted out. They can't bring them to remembrance anymore after the close of probation. When their sins are blotted out, do they have a knowledge of the sins that they committed? Yeah. Well, Ellen White says they don't. They don't, okay. Yeah, because their sins have been gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out. Um, so this is in the great controversy, so maybe we should look at this. Um, Now, it's in the chapter, um, because he talks about it in other chapters, but the one that's the most interesting is the time of trouble. So, it's up here. Um, so she says, when the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have, ac have accomplished their work. They have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then... Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, um, it is done. And all the angelic host lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still, Revelation 22, 11. Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made up. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation. And Jesus is to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. Um. So then she's going to deal with the time of Jacob's trouble, because that's actually the title of the chapter. So she says here, had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God would not have heard his prayer and merciful, mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. So, so I know that 
if you ask many people this question, for some reason, even though this is in the great controversy, we seem not to notice what she's saying. Now, there are some people who interpret this, well, what we can't bring to remembrance is uh, any concealed wrongs, right? So their, their, their view is, well, we, we remember all the sins that have been forgiven, but their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out. It's those sins that we can't bring to remembrance. So we have no more conscience of sins. Now, we have a deep sense of our own unworthiness. Now, Christ, did he have any knowledge of his own personal sins? We would say no, because Jesus didn't have any personal sins. But when he bore our sins upon the cross, did he not feel as a sinner feels? Yes. Now, how did he do that if he had no sins of his own? Well, he's tempted. Okay. He well, felt he the tempted. temptation. He felt the temptation. Okay. Yeah. So on the cross, though, our sins are placed upon him, correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, when were our sins placed upon Christ? When they went to the garden. Okay. So what, what is actually is happening? Uh, see, I would say that our sins were placed upon Christ when he took upon himself our nature. So he had to take a nature that was subject to death, a nature that had guilt, that felt guilt. But what was happening in the garden is not, not so much that he now is our sin bearer, because he has been our sin bearer from the moment he took our nature. But he's now being treated as a sinner by his father. Prior to that, the father says, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased says that at the baptism says it at the mount of transfiguration and one other place um, i'm trying to think where the other one is but when he is enters into that garden and even beforehand he starts to feel the sense of the weight of the sins of the whole world upon him now christ is no different than the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble. The cry that went from Christ's lips, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ellen White says, will also go from the lips of the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, unlike uh, Judas. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so different. Mm -hmm. and, and we can see this here when we look at the two classes that, that are there after the close of the probation. The righteous, they, they are in the same position that Christ was in. They have no, no sins that have been hidden. They, they can't remember actual sins, but they don't feel that they are righteous. They feel the separation from God. Right? They stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator to be considered the scum of the earth, to be the ones who are accused. Now, I've, I've said this many times before, but... Um, and, and I'm sure that some of you have experienced this. Um, I don't think I would be unique in this way. But when I was a child, if I saw somebody doing something bad, I felt guilty as if I had done it myself. Has anybody experienced that?
Now we become a bit desensitized. What was that again? What was that so, again? So, yeah. So the idea is that you know, especially when we were children, and we first saw a sin, like somebody doing something bad. Um, yeah. I remember feeling guilty as if I had done it myself. Yeah, I guess I could see that. Yeah. But of course, we become desensitized to this because of the media and movies and, and all the bad things that we witness. But Christ came in, into this world and and he is righteous. You know, he's holy, undefiled, separate from sinners. And yet he takes upon himself a nature that can feel guilt. And even when accused falsely by his brothers, he felt as if he was wrong. He didn't stand there in, in justification against the accusations that were being brought by his older brothers. As a child, he felt that he had done wrong. And that would be for things like sharing his food with other children who didn't have food and things like that. So he was actually actually acting in a righteous way. But his righteousness was condemned by those around him. And often we can be in that situation as well. But the 144,000 have no concealed wrongs, and yet they have this deep sense of their unworthiness. When the accusations come against them, all they can do is appeal to God's mercy and forgiveness. They don't appeal to their own righteousness to defend them. And Christ didn't appeal to his own righteousness. He appealed to his father's righteousness. And this is an important point in understanding the gospel. So this next paragraph, Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealings with Jacob that he will in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. The more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more sure the triumph of their great adversary. Those who delay in preparation for the day of God cannot obtain it in the time of trouble or at any subsequent time. The case of all such is hopeless. So this is the contrast that we have between the righteous and the wicked. And so we can see that there's no way that we can recommend to God any of our righteousness. We can't lower the standard just because Jesus has forgiven us and um, you know, we just accept his righteousness in our place. But that's the type of righteousness by faith that we see within Adventism is, well, I can't be righteous. So Jesus is just going to do it all for me. And so I don't really need to be that concerned about the sin I see in myself that we see in ourselves. Right. So this is this grave danger that many people are are in because of their belief system, because of what the church teaches. Now let us turn and read the third chapter of Romans. That tells the whole story without any further study than simply to read the texts. Romans 3, verse 19 to 22. We can say amen to every word of it now, right straight along. Now we know, that is so, that what so things soever the law saith, it saith to them, who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And is it not that? That which tells me that I am a sinner cannot tell me that I am righteous. But now, good. When? Congregation, now. All right, let us say so, brethren. But now the righteousness of God without the law, is manifested. That is so, is it not, congregation? Yes. The law cannot manifest it in us because we cannot see it there. It is there, but we are so blind that we can 
not see it there. Sin has so blinded and corrupted us that we cannot see it in the law. And if we could see it there, we could not get it there because there is not anything in us to start with that is fit for it. We are utterly helpless. So now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. What does that word believe mean when God speaks it? Congregation, faith. And what is genuine faith? Submission of the will to him, a yielding of the heart to him, a fixing of the affections upon him. That is what he means here to those who will receive him. Because believing is receiving when God speaks. He says so in the first chapter of John, 12th verse. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Then we can, everyone here, have it tonight. Can have it. Have it. Because we believe it. Well, now, that is the object of the law, then, is it not? To bring us to Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith, made righteous by faith, that his righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ, may be ours. That is it. Well, then, that is true. When we have got, um, well, then, well, when that is true, when we have got there, then what is the use of the law? Then what is the law for? Congregation, it witnesses. Exactly. Let us read now that part of the 21st verse that I did not read. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law. And see, some people don't want to have that part of it. They want the righteousness of God without the law you know, it's manifested without the law. But it has to be witnessed by the law. That is as far as we need to read just now. The other belongs there, though. Then when the law gives a knowledge of sin, in order that we may have the knowledge of the abundance of grace to take away the sin, then grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. And this righteousness of God, by faith in Christ, is our own through the working of the law. And this knowledge of sin has brought us to Christ. And we have him. The law is satisfied in all its demands that it may be that it has made upon us. Now, when it is satisfied in all its demands that it is made upon us, then will it stick to that and keep on saying that it is satisfied? That it is all right? When the law has made demands upon us that we cannot satisfy by any other possible means except by Jesus Christ being present in ourselves, then will the law of God, as long as we stay there, stand right there and say, that is right, and I am satisfied with it? Congregation, yes. Then if anybody begins to question it and says it is not so, then we have witness to prove it, have we? Now you see this, that it is necessary for several reasons that we should have witnesses. One, in our own connection and in our own personal experience is this, when God speaks and we believe it, then we know each one for himself that the righteousness of God is our own, that we are entitled to it, that it belongs to us and that we can rest in perfect peace upon it. But there are other people that need to know this too. Can they know it by my saying so? Congregation, no. Can they know it by my saying that I assent to this and that I say that it that is so and therefore it is so? Will that convince them? Is that proof enough to them, congregation? No. They need something better even than my word. Don't you see? The Lord has met that very demand and has given us witness, witnesses to which they can appeal and they can go and ask these witnesses whenever they please, whether this 
that we have is genuine or not. Is that so? Congregation, yes. They need not come and inquire of us. If they inquire of us, of course, we can tell them what the Lord has told us to say. And if that is not enough, they can go and ask those witnesses. We can say, there are, there are friends of mine. They know me from my birth till now. They know me better than I do myself. And if you want any more than this, that I say, go and ask them. And they will tell you. How many of them are there? Congregation, 10. Is their word worth anything? Do they tell the truth? Ah, they are truth itself. They are the truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. Well, then it is impossible for them to testify otherwise in bearing witness than that. When they say that that, that demand is satisfied, this life is well-pleasing to me. That is enough for anybody in the universe, is it not? Congregation, yes. So then, the man who claims to believe in Jesus and claims the righteousness of God, which comes to the believer in Jesus, is his claiming it enough for the world? Congregation, no. Or is our word in regard to it enough? Congregation, no. Well, they will say, and there are lots of them that will say it, why, yes, we believe in the Savior. I have a right to claim to the righteousness that he has, the perfect holiness and perfect sanctification that I have not sinned for 10 years, and I am above all temptation even, and I know it. Well, how do you know it? Why, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my heart and have for several years. Well, that is no evidence at all, for the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful above how many things? Congregation, all things. All things? Congregation, yes. Above Satan even? Congregation, yes. Um, is the heart actually deceitful above all things? Congregation, yes. He says so, whether we can understand it or not. It is more deceitful than Satan himself, isn't it? Congregation, yes. The heart will deceive me quicker and more often than Satan will. Well then, when that person feels in his heart, um, is that a good kind of evidence? When my heart says I, that I am good, then what is it doing? Congregation, it is deceiving. Solomon said, he that trusteth his own heart is a fool. And he is not only a fool, but he is fooled in this thing, is he not? Congregation, yes. It is bad enough for a wise man to be fooled, but when a fool is fooled, what in the world is the thing coming to? Therefore, we cannot afford to trust such things as that on such an important question as this. No, sir. We need better evidence than a man's heart that he has got the righteousness of God and that he is all right and is fit for the judgment and that he has not sinned for 10 years, holy and sanctified and above temptation, etc., etc. We need something better than that. And the fact is, the fact of the matter is, Jesus was here in this world a good while. And he never was above temptations while he was here. Christians are not either while they live. Well, then, that evidence is not enough. We want something more than that. And if that person who claims to have the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ has only that for a witness and his testimony can only can go only that far, then what is his claim worth? Congregation, nothing at all. Just nothing at all. It is a deceptive claim. He never can realize upon it. So the Lord has not left us there. Last night, we found in our lesson that when we want to know that these things are so in our experience, we are not to look within to find out whether it is so, but to look at what God says to see whether it is so. When we have found Jesus Christ and have him, then the Lord does not want us to look within to see whether he is there, he has furnished us witnesses whose testimony will tell us all the time that he is there. And these will tell everybody else that he is there. The righteousness of God is now manifested, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And when it is, it is witnessed by the law. And the law is first to bring us unto Christ. And after it has led us to Christ and we have found him, 
then it witnesses that that is just the thing. First, to give the knowledge of sin, and second, to witness to the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Well, then, anybody who uses the law of God for any other purpose than these two purposes at any time, what is he doing with the law of God? Congregation perverting it. He is perverting the whole thing. He is using it for purposes that God never intended at all. So then, though a man or an angel use the law of God in any way other, in any other way or for any other purpose than those two things, a man can use it for both, but angels can use it for one. He has perverted the law of God. Where is our righteousness from? Congregation God. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the faith of Jesus, face of Jesus Christ. Where do we find the knowledge of the glory of God, congregation, in the face of Jesus Christ? In the face of Jesus Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Then what is it that we see in the face of Jesus Christ, congregation, the glory of the Lord? And what is the glory of the Lord? We have read here, we have been told here, by the Spirit of God, that the message of the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that is the beginning of the glory that is to lighten the whole earth. Then what is the glory of God? His righteousness, his character. And where do we find it? In Jesus Christ. There is the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. He said so, you see. That is where we look for it. Do we look to the law for righteousness? Congregation? No. Even after we have been brought to Christ, do we look there for righteousness? Congregation? No. Where do we look for righteousness? In the face of Jesus Christ. There we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. From righteousness um, to righteousness, from character to character, from goodness to goodness, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this should be pretty clear. I mean, what Jones is laying out for us from the scriptures. Um, in that we know that the law can show us that we are sinners and that it can witness that we have the righteousness of God. But we don't get the righteousness of God from the law. We get it by beholding Christ. So if you try to get righteousness from the law, what will the law do other than condemn you? It can't do anything else. It could witness to the righteousness you have if it's the righteousness. The What's that? I was say, law can't convert. Yeah, it, it, it has a purpose. It has, yeah, so it has a purpose yeah. in showing us our sin, but it can't make us righteous. Right. Right. Because the law written on graven on stones is glorious, right? So the law has its glory because it it does show the righteousness of Christ because it witnesses to it. But we can't use it as the source of righteousness because we need the law written upon the heart. And this comes by a faith in Jesus Christ. This comes by beholding Christ. Only Christ can do that. Yeah. So some people think this is, is rather too abstract. But I think it's, it's, I, think it's I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. I, and I think it's pr very practical. That is, we're not looking to ourselves for righteousness. We're looking to God. But we believe that God can give us righteousness and a type of righteousness that the law can witness to because it is the righteousness of Christ, not our own righteousness. We don't change our own heart. Christ changes our heart. It doesn't mean that we don't um, 
you know, we just sit there and wait for Christ to do everything. We have to open the door of our heart. We have to remove the rubbish from the door. We have to allow Christ entrance. We have a choices that we make. But the work that is being done is done through Christ, his righteousness, not our own. <clears throat> so just go back and I'll read this paragraph again. So then don't you see how the righteousness of God and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand? Don't you see? That when we obtain the righteousness, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham, indeed, that then the Holy Spirit cannot be kept away from us. You cannot separate the two. They belong together. Then when we have that and know that we have that by the faith in his word, then he says we have a right to ask for the Holy Spirit and to receive it. I look at Galatians 4, verse 5. He came to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son um, into your hearts. He sends it. He does not want to hold it back. He sends it into the heart. It is a free gift. And then I say, don't you see that it is impossible to keep the righteousness of God and the Holy Spirit separate? So then, changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And when the image of God in Jesus Christ is found in us, what then? There is the impress, the seal of God. You have heard that in a, the other lessons, when by looking into the face of Jesus Christ and there alone, having received the righteousness of God, which is by faith in him. And the effect of that is to change us into the same image, to perfect the image of God and restore it in us by the working of the spirit of God upon the soul. And when that is done, then the same spirit of God is there to affix the seal of the living God, the internal, eternal impress of his own image. So then after we have come to Christ, after we have found him, then we do not look into the law for righteousness. Where do we look? Congregation in the face of Jesus Christ. Into the face of Jesus Christ. And while we look there, what does the law say? Congregation, that is right. The law testifies. That is the place to look. That is what I want you to have. That is satisfactory. We are perfectly agreed. Where in heaven do the angels look? Don't they look into the law to see whether they are right or not? Voice, always beholding the face of our father. Their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. Then where does the righteousness of the angels come from? Congregation, God. From God, through Jesus Christ, is it not? And what does the law in the throne of God, the foundation of his throne, what does the original copy of his law do there? When the angels look into the face of him who sits upon the throne, what does the law that never was touched by man and never could be, what does it do there? It witnesses to the righteousness of God, which they obtain without the law. This was always the true idea of the uses of the law of God. When the people had sinned and done anything against the commandments of the Lord concerning things which they ought not to be done and were guilty, then they were to bring the sacrifice they were forgiven, Leviticus 4. And then, as now, the commandments witness to the righteousness which they obtained by faith in Jesus. And therefore, the tabernacle was called the tabernacle of witness, Acts 7, 44, and Numbers 17, verse 7 and 8, and 18, verse 2. The tabernacle of the testimony is the same thing because testimony is the evidence given by a witness. So that the tabernacle was the tabernacle of witness or testimony. The ark was the ark of the testimony or witness because it contained the tables of the testimony. The tables of stone, the tables of the law were the tables of the test were uh, the tables of the testimony because they were the evidence of the witness which God appointed to witness to the righteousness of God, which comes without the law by faith of Jesus Christ alone. Then it is everlastingly true throughout the universe that if 
Righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 2.21. Forever and everywhere it is true that their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, and the law witnesses to the righteousness which all obtain from God without the law, but by Jesus Christ. Then isn't it true, as I said a while ago, that whether man or angel, if he uses the law of God for any other than one or both of these two purposes, he perverts the law of God entirely from what God ever intended. Well, then the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that satisfies everything, does it not? Everything now and how long? Congregation forever. Now and evermore, it satisfies everything. Well, then we may know for our own selves that it is ours by the evidences that God gave us last night, and they are everlastingly sure. And everybody in this world may know that we are in, entitled to it by the witnesses that God has given. Well, this is to fit us for the seal of God, the righteousness of God, in order that through this we may be changed from glory to glory into the same image. And when that is completed, what then? What witnesses to that congregation, the Sabbath of the Lord? It will witness to that finished, completed work all the way through. As Professor Prescott gave us in his sermon, it is the presence of Christ that makes holy and sanctifies the place where it is. And when the presence of Christ is there in its fullness, then what is that place that is sanctified? What is the significance, the sign of sanctification, congregation, the Sabbath? And sanctification, complete, is God's complete work in the soul. Then when the work of God is completed in the soul, the law of God will witness to it all the way. But what particular part of the law of God is to witness to that particular thing, the complete sanctification of his people? Congregation, the Sabbath of the Lord. It stands there as a witness and as the chief witness, and the two coming together testify, and the seal is affixed. That work is accomplished. Brethren, how can we get away from the seal of God? Then are we not right now in the time of the sealing? Congregation, yes. And it is through the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is it not? Yes, sir. And then when that seal is received, when that is affixed there, then these can stand through the time of the plagues, through all the temptations and trials of Satan, when he works with all power and signs and lying wonders. For the promise is, as thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And when that is passed, then entrance into the heavenly city. Entrance into the heavenly city. Thank the Lord. There are the tests that we are to pass through. But brethren, when we have this righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have that which will pass through every test. And in that day, there are going to be two parties there. There are going to be some there when the door is shut and they will want to go in and they say, Lord, open to us. We want to come in. And someone comes and asks, what have you done that you should come in? What right have you to enter the inheritance here? What claim have you upon that? Oh, we are acquainted with you. We have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. Yes, besides that we have prophesied in thy name and in thy name we have cast out devils and in thy name we have done many wonderful works. Why, we have done many wonderful things, Lord. Is not that evidence enough? Open the door. And what is the answer? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What did they say? We have done many wonderful works. We have done them. We are all right. We are righteous. We are just. Exactly right. Therefore, we have a right to be there. Open the door. But we does not count there, does it? There is going to be another company there that day, a great multitude that no man can number, all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they will come up to enter in. And if anyone should ask them the question, what have you done that you should enter here? What claim have you here? The answer would be, oh, I have not done anything at all to deserve it. 
I am a sinner, dependent only on the grace of the Lord. Oh, I was wretched, so completely a captive, and such a bondage that nobody could deliver me but the Lord himself, so miserable that all I, all I could ever do was to have the Lord constantly to comfort me, so poor that I had constantly to beg from the Lord, so blind that no one but the Lord could cause me to see, so naked that no one could clothe me but the Lord himself. All the claim that I have is that Jesus has done for me, but the Lord has loved me. When in my wretchedness I cried, he delivered me. When in my misery I wanted comfort, he comforted me all the way. When in my poverty I begged, he gave me riches. When in my blindness I asked him to show me the way that I might know the way, he led me all the way and made me to see. When I was so naked, that no one could clothe me. Why? He gave me this garment that I have on. And so all I can present, all that I have to present, is that upon which I can enter. Any claim would cause me to enter. Any claim that would cause me to enter is just what he has done for me. If that will not pass me, then I'm left out. And that will be just, too, if I'm left out. I have no complaint to make. But, oh, will not this entitle me to enter and possess the inheritance? But he says, well, there are some very particular persons here, and they want to be fully satisfied with everybody that goes by here. We have 10 examiners here. And when they look into a man's case and say that he is all right, why? Then he can pass. Are you willing that these shall be called to examine in your case? And we shall answer, yes, yes, because I want to enter in. And I'm willing to submit to any examination. Because even if I'm left out, I have no complaint to make. I'm lost anyway when I'm left to myself. Well, says he, we will call them. And so those 10 are brought up and they say, why, yes, we are perfectly satisfied with him. Why, yes, the deliverance that he obtained from his wretchedness is that which our Lord wrought. The comfort that he had all the way and that he needed so much is that which our Lord gave. The wealth that he has, whatever he has, poor as he was, the Lord gave it. And blind, whatever he sees, it is the Lord that gave it to him. And he sees only what is the Lord's. And naked as he is, that garment that he has on, the Lord gave it to him. The Lord wove it, and it is all divine. It is only Christ, by yes, he can come in. Here the congregation began singing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And then, brethren, there will come over the gates a voice of sweetest music, full of the gentleness and compassion of my Savior. The voice will come from within. Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Congregation, amen. Why standest thou without? And the gate will be swung wide open, and we shall have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, he is a complete Savior. He is my Savior. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul shall rejoice in the Lord, brethren, tonight. Oh, I say with David, come and magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. He has made complete satisfaction. There's not anything against us, brethren. The way is clear. The road is open. The righteousness of Christ satisfies. That is light and love and joy and eternal excellence. Isn't it true then of Isaiah 60 verse 1? Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Brethren, he can do it. He wants to. Let us let us let him. Congregation, amen. And let us praise him while he is doing it. Now, can't we praise the Lord? Then everybody in this house that wants to do it, you just go right ahead now. I will say amen to every word of it. For my soul magnifies him too, brethren. My soul praises him too, brethren. Because he is my savior. He has completed the work. He has done his gracious work. He has saved me. He saves all. 
Let us thank him forevermore. Professor Prescott says, the times of refreshing are the here, brethren. The spirit of God is here. Open the heart, open the heart, open the heart in praise and thanksgiving. So a very pow powerful message from Jones. And uh, probably not much that we need to comment on. Yeah, Jeff? No, I was just, just saying uh, all this was written down at, at the uh, at his lecture. All this was written down. Yeah. I mean, uh, somebody typing it out as he was talking or? Yeah. So what they used to do back there is they would have a stenographer. And yeah. Because, you know, they didn't have uh, tape recorders. Or, typewriters. Or, I don't think they had typewriters, right? Um, well, they did. But these would be done by shorthand. So somebody would copy it out in shorthand and then uh, write it out. They would then uh, typeset it and publish it. So yes, this is, um, uh, that's how they used to do it. Just like a court stenographer, you know, who takes the court record, even though they record it now, they still have somebody uh, sitting there recording everything. Right, right. But they, but they use a shorthand uh, typewriter. Like it's not a regular, they're not typing every letter. They have a system of doing it. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. But anyway, it's a pretty powerful <laughs> message. So yeah. I, I hope all of you have a blessed Sabbath. Yeah, thanks, you too. And we'll see, uh, Dwight will be presenting tomorrow morning. And of course, we don't have a Sabbath afternoon study, but we do have uh, the American group uh, presenting it's going to be Steve Welk presenting. I sent that in the email. And then we'll have, of course, the Sunday morning meeting and the Sunday afternoon study on um, examining the lines. Or the simple, simple presentation of the, the line simply presented, it's called. Okay, so let's uh, close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we are very, very grateful for the message this evening. We know, Lord, that um, you love us and that you sent your son to die for us, to redeem us from this world of sin. Help us to receive this gift at your hand, to trust in you, that you can, that you can show your righteousness through us that it will be all your righteousness and none of our own. We pray for the Sabbath, that it will be a blessing to each one. Continue to be with us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.